Hello everyone! Welcome to the Storytime with Billy Light Camera Teaching Podcast with me, Billy. Now, most of you probably have heard my voice before, telling many, many children's stories and quiz nights and concerts. And I've decided to take the plunge into the very popular world of podcasts, where I can hopefully give a voice to some of the many memories, experiences and crazy, crazy times I've had as a primary school teacher and also as a performer as well because most of you may know and some of you will not know and that's absolutely fine that I'm also a performer on the side and with the current climate being what it is performing particularly in person has taken a bit of a back seat but I'm not one to rest on my laurels and I've tried to include performing in my practice as much as possible and being a teacher you often find you're having to perform quite a lot anyway obviously a lot for Ofsted and for observations but just trying to maintain a class for any length of time requires some kind of performance skills so through this podcast I'm hoping to share some of the links between teaching and performing and actually how they're not all that different certainly on some days but I thought I would start today's podcast because this is all new for me so I don't know how long to waffle on for, what sort of things you'll be interested in hearing. So do let me know in the comment section of this podcast, however you listen to it, be it on YouTube or on Facebook. Do let me know what you'd like to hear next as we continue on, because your feedback is incredibly important. So here we go. This is the first one. And I thought a great start to this would be for me kind of to reintroduce myself and tell you what I do what I get up to, and why I chose to go into the crazy prof profession that is primary school teaching. Now, I know when I first told people I was interested in primary school teaching, most of them said, don't do it, you'll, you won't have any life, you'll have no free time and you won't enjoy yourself. But I've always known in my heart that actually, if I am going to be a primary school teacher, I am always going to have a life on the outside as well. And now being three years into my career, I know more than ever how important it is to be able to have a good work-life balance, particularly in teaching, because it is hard work and it isn't just playing with children all day and just doing drawings and doing colouring, as some people would lead you to believe. But before we get into the nitty-gritty of teaching and what it looks like now, let's go way, way back to the year 2008, if you can cast your mind 13 years back, because for me, that's where my passion and my drive for wanting to work in education began. Now I've always enjoyed working with children, I've always found working with children and trying to inspire them a really thing that was a thing that's close to my heart and I've always wanted to be in some kind of profession where I'm able to make a difference. Now of course I'm very theatrical and when I was doing my GCSEs I was all set to do drama and follow my dreams and go to the West End and be a superstar. But my own anxieties, my own self-confidence kind of knocked me back from doing that because I kept telling myself, oh, I'm not good enough. I'm not the best singer. I'm not a good dancer. Drama school's too expensive. And other voices as well were telling me that probably wasn't the right career path to go down. But I know how much I enjoyed theatre and performing arts. And actually, I didn't want to just throw that away. And I knew as well that I also enjoyed education and teaching and learning and through doing drama at GCSE we had to visit primary schools and a special school as well to perform shows for them and also to um, retirement homes as well performing for lots of different clientele and I really liked working with those different groups of people and having to adapt to the way I spoke to them and talked to them and speaking to them on different levels and I found that really interesting and I got a real buzz from teaching and learning with those children even from those small like drama workshops that we did so that was an early indicator that I thought mm, this might be a job that I could be quite good at but how it really began this is still back in 2008 that's when I was at secondary school which feels like a lifetime ago I'm rambling I do apologize so 2008 we were all set up to do our work experience which was the case when you were in year 11 you would go and do a week's placement in a place of your choice it could be a barbershop it could be a mechanics it could be a bakery whatever you wanted to do in the future whatever you had an interest in at the time and I still feel now there's so much pressure for everybody to decide 
at that young age. And 15, 16 is, is young to be deciding what you do for a future career. And I know many people now who change career later in their life as well. And I think that's absolutely fine because you never quite know how life is going to treat you or where life is going to take you. And this is kind of where the story kicks into a gear. Now, being young, determined, theatrical me, I wanted to go and pursue something to do with performing arts. And of course, trying to find performing arts jobs and opportunities for work experience in North Devon is fairly limited in the grand scheme of things. Now, I had put an application in to do some work experience at the local college to work backstage in the theatre department and see how the theatre team work. And I was really geared up for that, thinking this is my first step on the ladder to being a West End star. And then suddenly, and I say suddenly, this was the Friday before I was meant to start the next week, the placement fell through. And I was absolutely beside myself. I thought, this is it. I'm never going to be an actor. I'm never going to go to the West End because I can't go to the college and do some work experience. So I was shell-shocked. I didn't know what I was going to do. And the careers advisor, and she, I have to thank her for this because she really put me in the right direction. She said, well, actually, I can see on your list of um, um, ideas for what you want to pursue as a career, you've got a teacher on there. And I thought, well, I'm not going to be able to get a placement now because there are 300 students in my year group. All the schools are probably taken. And this careers advisor stayed after school. She used her own time and she found me a placement at a small village school for a week. And I hugged her. I was so happy that I had somewhere to go that I just hugged her. And all this disappointment from not being able to go to this theatre placement suddenly subsided because I was going to go to a school and I thought, oh, well, maybe this is a sign. Maybe case or ass or whatever will be, will be. So I got myself G'd up. I dressed in my smartest clothes as a 15-year-old would have at the time. And I don't really have the best dress sense, let's face it. I mean, you've probably seen me wear my waistcoat on Storytime with Billy. I don't wear that all the time. I used to wear bow ties a lot. And I do as a teacher, but I'm, anyway, I'm digressing. So I went to this small village school and I had the best week ever. And even though I was essentially acting in the role as a TA that week and just watching what the teachers did, I just threw myself in there getting to know the children and getting involved in their play and their learning and just asking lots of questions. And just even working with them in small groups and not being a teacher at that time, I just felt so inspired. There was something so moving and incredible about making a difference. And even through that small week, there were changes that I noticed in the children, not by my own doing because I was only there for a short time, but... It was amazing just how much of an impact that week's placement had on my future. And from that moment on, I knew, I absolutely knew in my heart that I wanted to be a teacher. But there was still a sense of being com conflicted there because I still wanted to be a performer as well. And I thought, but I've been setting my whole life on going to the West End and being a world-class star. But now I'm really interested in being teaching. So what on earth am I going to do? Another moment at that small village school I've just remembered that really stayed with me. There was a girl there who had Down syndrome and I found it really fascinating. And I'm sh I know things are mostly different now and I hope so anyway. That this child, bless her, with Down syndrome was kind of just on her own. Like I remember being outside for play with all the children and this girl was just on her own in the corner. And of course she struggled to socialise and interact. And I went over and spoke to her and asked her if she wanted to go and play or maybe go and find some friends. Because I hated the thought of seeing this person on their own. And one of the teachers just said to me, oh, just leave her. That's what she does every day. And I just thought, well, that's not right. That's not on at all. Like, it doesn't matter whether this girl has done this forever or whether she has a special learning need or whether she has a disability. Nobody should be on their own on the playground. And I... I'd already had a, a tolerance and kind of an understanding of people with special educational needs because my aunt was headmistress of a special school. So all my life I'd been exposed to that kind of environment and meeting people with different needs and abilities. And when you, it's, it was quite intimidating at first, first meeting these children and students with learning difficulties because it's different to what we know, the norm. But I, over time, learned to accept that these are just people, but people who are different. And that's brilliant because we should celebrate difference. 
So that kind of understanding and tolerance led me to believe that this girl with Down syndrome shouldn't be on her own. That actually she does need support. And even though she's in a mainstream setting and maybe it wasn't right for her at the time, she shouldn't ever have to be on her own. And there should be people intervening to help her to socialize and to be able to engage with her peers. And it may have been a lack of understanding from the children in that school as well that maybe they didn't know how to respond to this child and maybe they hadn't been told how to or encouraged to do that so that's another thing that really sparked me to want to make a difference and i also led me to work in my aunt's special school that's not how i got the job i did earn it on my own merit later on and my background in sen was really a sticking point has really helped me to move forward in my teaching career so i did this week at the village school i had a newfound thirst to want to be a teacher while still battling this inner conflict about wanting to go to the West End and be a superstar. How many times can I say West End in the podcast? Tally it if you like. I'll give you a score at the end if you get them all right. So, I was heading on a career path, either to the starry lights of the West End, or to the scrubbing blackboards of primary school. I mean, that wasn't a really a good analogy, but you, you, you get the picture. So, I did my work experience, and I knew if I wanted to go further in teaching, I would have to do more. So... Over the next few years, I finished my GCSEs. I did pretty well. I got mostly Cs. I got an A and RE, and I'm very proud of that. Hasn't always come in useful, but I got an A and RE and a B in drama. So take of that what you will. So I finished my GCSEs. And it was at this point I thought, what am I going to do at college? Now, I still had teaching there and wondering, what am I going to, what A levels am I going to have to do if I was a teacher? And to be honest, careers, advice, and choosing your options for pet truck the college i went to wasn't really handed to us at secondary school we didn't really have that much help with it so i chose a bunch of a levels to do and i had a bit of theater in there as well thinking well if i'm not going to be an action west end i'll put some theater there too and then i started hearing some of some of my friends who are doing the full b-tech national diploma in performing arts and i just thought well my head is telling me go and be a teacher but my heart is telling me to follow my theatre dreams so i threw in the a levels i decided not to pursue those and i decided to go for the national diploma in performing arts which is where i met one of my lifelong friends who was my lecturer and yeah i i auditioned for that course i got on and i spent two years doing performing arts and i absolutely loved it i mean it's it helped me to grow in so many ways admittedly i've never been a very very confident person i've always been quite shy and there's always this stigma that because i'm on stage everyone thinks i'm super confident and i am when i'm on stage because i absolutely love what i do and of course when i'm in front of a class i'm doing what i love so i am super confident but in real life i'm kind of just shy and i have a lot of self-doubt as well which i think is very common among teachers and certainly from people i've spoken to it's very very common for teachers to knock ourselves and tell what tell ourselves we're not good enough maybe it's the environment we live in maybe it's all the pressures that we have as teachers because there are a lot of things that teachers are expected to do that's another podcast for another time but yeah if anything before the performing arts course really helped me to start believing in myself and knowing that i am confident i am capable of doing good things and i am an okay performer look i'll put my hands up i'm not the best performer in the world there's always going to be somebody better than i am let's just face it but i think what makes me stand out is the fact that i'm truly passionate about it and I think that's what radiates more than having the most beautiful singing voice, the most pointed feet, and the most intense acting performance ever. It's heart that shines through on stage. So, like, when I've auditioned people before, or when I've worked with children in drama clubs and through my... I work at a drama school as well for children, alongside the teaching, and that's another thing that I do. And, yeah... I always look for the heart and for the people who are really putting their all into it. That's what makes a truly good performer, I think. And you can you can have all the talents in the world, but if you haven't got a true heart there and a true passion that shines through, then it doesn't really do anything for me. So I think I've always had that, and that will never, ever go away, no matter what. At least I hope it won't. Anyway, at the moment, I'm still a very passionate performer. Where does this sit into teaching, I hear you ask? Well, I started coming to the end of my national diploma and then I had to start thinking about whether I was going to go to uni to pursue acting further. I, I, my self-doubt and my inner voice was telling me I'd never get into drama school. And it was so much money. And I know my parents were concerned about me pursuing drama. 
and I and my parents are so so supportive of me. They really have been. I mean, they've always kept their guard up for me, and they've always advised me to make sure I know what I'm doing and to check finances, etc. My parents have always been so caring, and now that I've got my dream job as a teacher, they couldn't be happier because they know I've kept going for it. They know I've worked hard. My parents are amazing, but they were concerned about what I was going to do next because I was really all over the place. I'm thinking, I'm at the end of my diploma. Do I go to uni and pursue acting knowing that I may not have a career at the end of it? Or is this the time to start pursuing my teaching dreams? So it got to kind of June and I still didn't really know what I was doing. And this was a problem because most of my friends and my colleagues, for better use of the word, were going off to uni in September and I still didn't have a clue what I was doing. And my lecturer said to me, well, there's the foundation degree in theatre. You do two years at Petrock, you two years carrying on at college, and then you do your third year away at uni. And I was at a point now, I'm quite a home bird. I love where I live in North Devon and I love being in the countryside. And I love my family and the thought of moving away at that time was just terrifying. So the thought of doing a foundation degree on my doorstep at the same time college that I've been doing my diploma for for the last two years seemed very appealing so I signed on for that and it was a very small cohort as well there was me there was my best friend Grills I met a guy called Jamie on that course and we we got on like a house on fire and I thought actually if I do this degree I could do my three-year degree and then I could do my teacher training on the top of that because I was told that was a route into it and I knew I would have to get more experience so I did this theatre degree for two years at Petrock and then my third year at Plymouth University. And once I got away from my third year, I wish I'd gone away earlier because I think having that time away from home and being on my own did wonders for me and just taught me to be self-sufficient, self-confident. But all that time while I was doing this theatre degree, I was really enjoying it, but it just made me wish I'd pursued the teaching side of things earlier because I thought as a teacher, I'll be able to do my day job as a teacher and then do all my dramatics in the evening or my amdram and... Uh, any other opportunities that came up so third year of my degree i was having to start thinking about applying for teacher training but already i was being told that it was unlikely i would get onto a teacher training course and a one-year school direct which is eventually what i ended up doing without experience so i decided well if i maybe postpone the teacher training for a bit and go and get some experience so i started looking out for teaching assistant jobs and thinking that would be a good way to get into teaching and as a TA being able to observe the teachers and understanding how a school works and working with a range of different children of ages and abilities so luckily a job came up at my aunt's special school where she was the headmistress and she said maybe you should consider applying for it and as my aunt she would have no say in whether I got the job or not she would be non-biased and she would leave it to the rest of the senior leadership team now, I did apply for a, a TA job there, and I didn't get it, but there was an MTA job, a mealtime assistant, which I thought, well, it's only an, an hour every day, but it's getting my foot on the ladder. So I went for the MTA job and thought, okay, I'll do that, and maybe I'll find a part-time job on the side. And my parents said, you must get a part-time job because you won't have any money, and now you're back from uni, you must pay us, which is understandable, because I was still living with my parents at the time. So I had this MTA job. And I thought, great, I'll be able to get into the school and hopefully some more permanent TA jobs will come up as well. And as chance would have it, at the end of the summer, I was contacted by the school and they said, oh, I wonder whether you would be able to be a full-time TA covering in one of the key stage four classes because this, this special school goes from ages three up to 19. So it goes all the way from nursery all the way up to sixth form. So I was asked to be in a key stage four class, so year 10 and 11. And if I could be a TA in there for the first few weeks until they found a permanent TA replacement. And I thought, brilliant, that's my foot in the door. I wouldn't even have to do the MTA job. I would just go straight into being a TA. And I got into that class and I was, the, the team I worked with was so lovely. They were so welcoming because this was my first time working as a TA. Now, prior to this, I should have mentioned earlier that over the years, like when, while I was doing my diploma, my degree, I went to do a summer at uh, like an, an, a summer holiday club working with young children. That was at a farm nursery and I did a summer working there doing their holiday clubs and running drama. I also did some work experience at this special school working with some PMLD classes, 
telling stories. See, there's a link there. Telling stories and singing songs. And I also helped my friend who was working at the school at the time run a drama club as well. So I'd had those experiences under my belt. But this was my first time working as a teaching assistant in a classroom. And I was quite nervous, but I knew this is what I wanted to do. And once I had that first day, I, I just knew I'm going to be a teacher. And I'm going to work in education for the rest of my life. Because working with those students and being in that environment was just the most incredible thing. And every day was different. Every day was remarkable working as a TA in that special school because the children were so dynamic and diverse there was such a range of needs and abilities and that really gave me a good start in to eventually being a teacher and having to adapt learning for different ages and different abilities and for children with EHCPs that's an early health and care plan and children with SEN special educational needs there are so many acronyms in teaching and maybe I need to do a podcast on that as well just to be able to clarify what they all mean but that TA job just gave me the best start possible in my teaching career. So I had that TA job temporary for a few weeks and then the interviews came up and I applied for the full-time TA job. And as I'm aware, permanent jobs are like gold dust for teaching assistants, for teachers, especially down here in North Devon. So to get one, I had to thank my lucky stars. And for the interview, I was asked to read a story to a mixed group of children, mixed ages, mixed abilities, mixed needs. And I thought, right, well, I'm working in a school where there are children who have lots of sensory needs. Not all children will be able to see or use all their senses to their fullest abilities. Not all children will be able to read. And not all children will be able to understand spoken language. So I needed to include a mix of techniques here. So I could use Makaton signing, which I, I absolutely adore. And I was definitely inspired by Mr. Tumble and something special to be able to use Makaton, not just for children with special needs, but for all children so that everybody can communicate. Total communication is so important. So I knew I'd have to be able to sign my story while also being able to show the pages of the book. I include some communicating print symbols so it would show what the words meant so that some children could read the words that way. I also wanted to make it interactive and engaging and because the story I chose to read was The Very Hungry Caterpillar. Oh, that story's got fruit in and food, so I can give the children foods to eat. And I also checked up their dietary requirements beforehand as well, when I knew what group I would be having, so that was good. But also, the children came in with a TA as well, who was able to advise me on that. And I had objects that they could hold and touch and smell. Well, of course, they could do that with the food. So I had the tiny egg and the leaf. My dad as well, I have to thank my dad for this because I think without him, I probably wouldn't have gotten this job. But I'm, he helped me make a hungry caterpillar and we had this pom-pom head so that was glittery and it sparkled so that was a great sensory element for the caterpillar. And he, we covered it in lots of different textures and some tissue paper. We had some dongly antennae as well. And dad helped me to make that. And I could see just by him sitting and making that caterpillar with me, I could see how much he wanted me to get that job. My dad, even though he's quite a quiet man, doesn't say a lot, I just see how proud he is of me. And that means more to me than he will ever truly know. So dad, if you do listen to this podcast and you get 23 minutes in, thank you for always believing in me, for sometimes giving me tough love and for making that caterpillar. You are my hero. Thank you, dad. So I did the interview. I did the story with the... um the children and it seemed to go down really well i particularly enjoyed the food part because you know me i just love eating and the children did as well and it just made the story even more engaging for them because they could really feel part of it and they could understand how the caterpillar felt about eating the food and we taught them some new signs and i'd asked around already for some of the makaton champions in the school to teach me some of those more difficult fruits for better use of a word those more diverse fruits so like cherries and pineapples so I, I learned some new signs through doing that and I had staff meeting after school that night and I was just on tenterhooks waiting to hear if I'd got this TA job and then the business manager called me into her office and I thought she had a very serious look on her face and I thought well maybe there are just people with more experience out there and you know what I did my best but I would be heartbroken if I didn't get the job because I'd settled into this class working with a team and getting to know the children and I really didn't want it to be over. And she called me into the office. 
And she had this very stern look on her face. And at this point, I just wanted her to tell me I hadn't got the job. I just needed this pain to be over so I could move on and get on with my life and maybe pursue a dream of being in the West End. So, <laughs> she called me into the office and she looked at me. Never have we seen such a high score from a teaching assistant's interview. And I know this sounds like I'm blowing my own trumpet. I know it does. But she showed me the score sheet because I think the panel's score each of the questions out of about 10 or something or they score they score something out of 10 but she showed me the notes from my interview and there were just nines and tens all over the place and i'll tell you now i burst into tears because i just couldn't believe after spending so long feeling like i wasn't good enough or i didn't have the ability or that i didn't have the experience for somebody to sit there and tell me how amazing they thought my interview was and there was a note on there as well that said should be applying for a teacher job and i just i was weeping in the office because it meant so much to me because i put my heart and soul into that interview and for then somebody to validate that and to say that they could see that passion and they could see that drive it just spoke volumes to me and then my aunt who was the head came in because of course she had nothing to do with the interview and she came in and said how proud she was of me and how I needed to pursue this dream of being a teacher. And eventually, I did. I worked as a TA for three years. I worked in Key Stage 4, Key Stage 3, and then in the sixth form. And all of those classes provided me with different opportunities, working with different teams, all amazing. And I'll go into those in a different video about my background in special education. But I wanted just this to be an overview of how I got to where I am now. So hopefully you're still enjoying this podcast. I never know how long these things should go on for but that's what you can give me some feedback about afterwards about whether it's too long whether i ramble too much because believe me i do and if you've seen my um story time videos you'll know that i like to ramble on so i did three three years as a ta at the special school and by the third year i was itching to move on i felt felt right i've got some experience under my belt I've got my degree, I've been pursuing other outlets as well, trying to get my foot on the teaching ladder. So I decided to start applying for some school direct programmes. And one that came up was the Atlantic Coast Cooperative Trust, which was through Marjon, which is a university in Plymouth. And it was a local school direct with schools in the North Devon area. And I thought that would be brilliant because I still wasn't quite keen to move away. I wanted to do this training local so this seems perfect so i applied for that and i was lucky enough to get an interview at a local school in north devon where i would which was one of the schools in the trust and it, i was going to be teaching a group of year threes okay th i was already a bit nervous because this was mainstream and i wasn't sure quite how different it would be to sen but there was a teacher i was working at in the sixth form at this special school who was just the most supportive ever she gave me ideas for the lesson I had to teach. I had to teach her an English lesson. So she went through the year three curriculum with me. She sat down and looked at my lessons plans. She let me teach the lesson to her and she was so supportive and I couldn't thank her enough really for all the love and support she gave me in that. I also, alongside having to teach a year three group some English, I had to teach the rest of the candidates and the whole panel. And this whole panel was made up of heads and mentors from the act trust that was terrifying i had to teach them a skill now the first teacher i worked with at this special school taught me how to make 3d snowflakes and i thought oh that would be good i could do that but i thought i'm gonna have to make this inclusive and show my experience from sen so i thought how am i gonna be able to teach 3d snowflakes to a whole group of people and make sure they're all following my instructions and i know i can talk quite fast so i thought well I need to think of signs, spoken language, and symbols. So I had a pre-made model of the snowflake. I had models and resources for everybody to have a go. I also took pictures of each stage of the snowflake as it was built. And I also had written instructions as well. So that should be enough for everybody to be able to engage if they weren't following my instructions directly. Because even the most astute and studious a person can struggle to follow a lot of instructions one after the other so sometimes pictures and words can help and 
as it so happens, it did because all of these head teachers were enjoying making these snowflakes. And I think some of them, there wasn't quite enough for everybody because I didn't know there were going to be so many people on the panel. They were all fighting over who was going to make the snowflake. It was certainly quite amusing to see all of these well-dressed like heads of schools fighting over who makes a paper snowflake. So I've always had that vivid memory. And I taught the lesson to some year threes and that was, I think it went really well. I did some work on adjectives and boosting vocabulary based on Fantastic Mr. Fox. And we had a picture of the farmers and it was finding different words to describe how they looked. You know, bog is buns and bean, one fat, one short, one lean. So what other words can we use for fat? Huge, gargantuan, chubby, grotesque. And then they created sentences using the adjectives that they came up with. So some of the, it was a very mixed ability group. So some of the children came up with their own and I provided some pictures and some symbols and some bonus words to help some of those children who were struggling. And the panel noticed that and said it was good to see that I was thinking of all abilities. And of course, I could make the links from my work in SEN. And I was so thrilled when they said, we'd like to offer you a place on the course to do my teacher training. That was just the most incredible moment. Because I was waiting all afternoon. I did the interview. I went and got a McDonald's because I just needed to comfort eat at that point. And I was at home with mum and I just wondered whether I'd done enough. And mum was with me when I got the email and it was just so joyous and triumphant. I just felt like my dreams were about to come true. I was going to be a teacher and I was so, so excited. So I had a few months left as a TA and a moment that really struck with me, I, I used to run an after school club with, for drama at this school. And it was the last, very, very last session. And I hadn't been told that it was the last one and that we wouldn't be doing drama today, that all the after school clubs would be in together and we'd be doing some fun games. So I felt a bit put out because nobody had told me or maybe I'd, there'd been some miscommunication. But so while we were all setting up, I had made some collages of the children in my drama club with some pictures of their work because we d did Romeo and Juliet with the drama club. And it was just incredible to see these children who struggle with confidence and with speech to be able to perform a an adapted version of to be or not to be, like using signs and like adapted language. It was just phenomenal. So I made a collage for each of them to take home and to show their parents what they've been doing. And I'd written a personal message on the back. And I was writing on the back and there was a TA there who was asking me what I was doing. And I said, I was quite admittedly I was quite annoyed with her at the time and I said I'm making these collages for the children and I didn't really want to talk to this today because they'd wound me up and they'd been quite rude to me and perhaps I was being rude back and we, we, we all can be sometimes when we've had a miscommunication or something's not gone our way sometimes it can throw us off so I was just trying to write these collages out and she kept going on at me to come over and help and I said I'm just going to write these up and I've, I will be right there I'm still in the classroom I've still got my eye on things and she looked over at my writing and she said, you can't even write properly. How on earth are you going to be a teacher? And do you know what? I felt so put out and angry and heartbroken that this person had the nerve to look at my writing and knowing full well that this is what I was going into and just shoot it down. And I said to her, well, I am going to be a teacher because I've got the passion and... I care about these kids and I just walked out at that point saying I'm sorry I just need five minutes because it really upset me that this person wanted to rain on my parade and put me down when I was already feeling a bit vulnerable anyway and that just set my world into disarray thinking how on earth am I going to be a teacher if I can't write maybe this Pertier is right maybe I'm overreacting maybe I need to s rethink my choices but it also gave me a drive thinking well I'll show this person that I can be a teacher because I've got the drive and I'm not going to be perfect all the time. I'm going to do teacher training so I can learn what to do. And I will improve my handwriting. And funnily enough, I look back at one of my first ever teaching observations. When I was training, I got told I needed to sort my handwriting out and write in cursive because I hadn't done it in so long. Next observation, they said, oh, your cursive is fantastic because I went home and thought I'm not going to lose out on this handwriting again. And perhaps I needed that confrontation with that TA to give me the boost I needed to not give up. And thankfully, I didn't see that TA again. And 
maybe if we ever cross paths again, we can put that water under the bridge. Because maybe they, maybe it came from a place of love. I don't know. It just seemed rude at the time. So I left the TA job and started my teacher training. And I did my training at the same school I did the interview at, which I was really, really pleased about. Because when I first walked into that school, I just felt an immediate connection there. I was thinking, I really hope I get this for my main placement. And I did. And I got my main placement there, which was in year four, because when I first started teacher training, I was convinced I wanted to work with the older children in Key Stage 2. So I got a, key, a year four placement, which was awesome. And my first class were absolutely amazing. I really like year three and four because they're kind of at that age where they're not too young that they don't know anything at all, but they're not too old that they're not getting <laughs> quite too big for their boots. They're a really good age. There's some really good topics in year four. And you could build some really fantastic relationships with the children. So I was really excited to be in year four. I had a great teacher to work alongside. She was Welsh. She was kooky. She was a little bit mad. But most teachers are. And she was great fun to work with. And we also had a fantastic TA in there as well. Who made amazing displays. Was great with resourcing. And was fantastic for running interventions with the children as well. So I landed on my feet really. With this year four class. My fondest memory of first starting my teacher training, we were doing a topic on ancient Egypt and the class teacher, for the first few weeks, I was kind of observing what the teacher was doing. Because what they don't really tell you about a school direct teacher training is that it is full on. You are pretty much thrown in the deep end. You have 20 days at uni to do all your theory, which most people would do in three years. And you're just thrown in the deep end. And it's crazy. When I was there, you, do, you teach 30% of the time for the first term. 40% for the second term and then the summer term you're teaching 70% of the time which is pretty much three and a half days a week so it's crazy how quickly it escalates but luckily I had plenty of time I absolutely love the school direct and I would encourage anybody who's looking to go into teaching to do the school direct it's bloody hard work and you've got to sink or swim there's no in between and you'll quickly know whether it's the right path for you but being in that school all the time and just learning everything on the spot was just it was exhilarating it gives you an adre adrenaline rush so i would highly recommend it anyway before i went into how crazy it was my first week we were learning about ancient egypt and the class teacher wanted the children to write a recount on meeting a mummy and i was thinking oh cool are we going to get a visitor in to dress up as a mummy i probably shouldn't have mentioned i was into theater because the teacher turned to me and said oh that's great you can be the mummy. You can dress up as the mummy. I'm doing a Welsh accent. It's probably awful. You can dress up as the mummy and you can go on an adventure around the school and the children can write about it. And I thought, oh, what have I let myself in for? And <laughs> I remember being in the staff room and two TAs who I just met the week before wrapping me up in tissue paper from head to toe. And they had to tape it all in so it didn't fall off. And yeah, I got to know them very well in that first week and i'll say no more about that and i was there as a mummy i could hardly see because they wrapped my face up as well i must have bumped into so many things in that school and bear in mind i was still getting to know this school as well so finding my way around in the first instance was a nightmare so there i was dressed as a mummy scaring children like playing with pe equipment going on the climbing frames and the children went absolutely bananas as anybody would seeing a mummy doing this to be fair most of them had sussed out it was it was me because i wasn't there with them when they went to meet the mummy but that was a great start and that also told me that actually you've got to make these experiences as immersive as possible for the children and get them excited get them wanting to write about what they've seen get them really engaged and get them doing these things in real life we can't expect children to do things if we wouldn't do it ourselves so if we want them to write about a mummy and get into that moment i'm gonna dress up as a mummy so and I will talk about my year in teacher training in a lot more detail in another podcast. Again, I, like I said, this one was just a, an overview of where I started, where I've been, and possibly where I'm going as well. So I did my teacher training in this main school for most of the year. But for a half term, I had to go to a different setting and teach another year group and work with different children. So my main setting was in a two-form entry Church of England school. And for my second placement, which was from the, the January half term, I went to a small village school, one form entry, and I worked in year one. Now, the thought of working with anyone, like, in that age group, like, early years, year one, absolutely repulsed me at the time, because I just 
didn't think that was where my um, skill set was. Now, I've never really opened up about the story I'm about to tell you, but I went to work at this school in year one, and I can honestly tell you, I almost dropped out. I almost left. I have never been in a place where I have been broken down and belittled so much. It's incredible what an impact our words as educational professionals, as teachers, can have on other people. And it harks back to that comment that TA made. Because teacher training and teaching in general is really hard. It's really bloody hard. And we're always so focused on the mental health and the well-being of the students. But it's often the teachers and the educational staff who get left behind. Now, I didn't know a lot about year one. And going into a new setting, having come from a school that was so welcoming, so lovely, it made me feel like I'd been there for years. Going to a new place for only six weeks, but it felt like forever, where... I felt like I wasn't welcome, where I felt like I was messing up all the time. It was just horrible. And the teacher I worked with, I could see that she was very experienced. And I could see that she had a very certain way of doing things. And I thought that maybe we'd get along. And some days we really did and we had a good laugh. But when I asked her questions, I always got a response as if I should already know it or as if I was stupid. And if I messed something up, it wasn't, oh, let's talk about it and reflect. It was, well, you should have done that right or... Oh, well, you should know about that. You should have researched it. You should have looked it up. And I never felt like I was improving there. And I was scared to make any mistakes in case I got belittled or patronised. And my mentor at that school wasn't terribly supportive either. And I found myself getting really, really upset because I felt like I couldn't do it. And rather than them giving me some motivation or some advice, it was kind of like, well, you need to do it right. Otherwise, you're not going to be a teacher. And like when it came to assessments and lesson planning, I asked for help, but it should be, well, you should be doing it yourself. But it's never a problem to ask questions. In fact, I still ask questions now to my co-teachers and to my other um, staff members because it's important. We, I've been teaching for three years now and I still don't know everything. In fact, I think I'll be teaching for 20 years and I still won't know everything. It's so important to ask questions. So to go somewhere where I wanted help and I wanted advice and just to be shot down and patronised and belittled. And I was broken down there. I wept and cried. And I was going through some personal troubles at the time as well, which made it really difficult. But it was just so unsupportive. And I almost quit. I thought, well, maybe these people are right. Maybe I am crap at teaching. And I was doing my PPA with this teacher. And we both had our laptops out. And I wasn't looking at this other person's laptop. But I could see a message tied and it was going to my mentor at the same school and it was titled our drama queen now maybe i'm overreacting but i saw my name in there as well and i didn't pry i didn't ask but it looked like they were sending messages to each other about me and referring to me as a drama queen now mental health is so prominent at the moment and so to be called a drama queen for being upset and for wanting to do my best and feeling like i was on my own it made me feel so angry. At that point, I just wanted to ask her about it at that moment. But then I thought, what's the point? I'll just get shot down. And as a trainee teacher, I won't have a leg to stand on. So I got through to the end of the placement. I also did a drama club while I was there. And that was really, really good. We put on Fantastic Mr. Fox for the year fives and sixes. And we performed it to the, the rest of the school. And that was something I felt really, really proud of. Because the children I worked with were really, really great. They were really enthusiastic about drama and the head of the school said he it was amazing to see the children learn a, a mini play in such a short space of time and he was really grateful the head of that school was fantastic they were a really really nice person and i they were really supportive as well so i can't knock that at all but there are just some people who don't realize what an effect their words can have even if they think they're trying to be constructive and don't get me wrong the teachers i work with were clearly really experienced and i know that they have got good hearts but the way i felt treated there was just appalling and it almost sent me packing from teaching completely so it's always made me think really carefully about how i use my words to inspire other people i would never want anybody to feel belittled by the things i said to them teachers students or otherwise and that was a huge reality check in thinking i have to be aware of what an impact I can have that as humans we have the ability to raise people up or break them down completely so always be kind even if some days you're at your wits end you've had a tough day you're stressed because it happens to all of us even the most experienced teachers who profess to being 
all together will have their breakdowns and that's natural but it's how you rise up from it and how you are supported that makes such a difference so always look to work with people who you know are going to champion you and raise you up because we all need to be champions some days because we all have dark days in our lives we all need that support and i just wish i would had it at that school because i did enjoy my moments there and there were flashes where i thought oh i quite like year one i like what i'm teaching i like the more play-based approach and i like the fact that the children can still follow their own interest and i'm working in year one now so it's kind of gone full circle and i absolutely love year one so it just goes to show that even if you have a bad experience in one place it doesn't mean that's going to be the case for everywhere you go so eventually i returned to my main placement in year four and it's fair to say my confidence was well and truly knocked and this came up a lot in my observations that my mentor who was also the head of the school and just somebody who i admire so so much i'll go into this person in a bit more detail later they could see that my confidence had been knocked and they unlike the other school which decided to belittle me and tell me well you should have done more work decided to talk to me about it and get to the bottom of how i was feeling this way and they always championed me they told me they believed in me they gave me constructive criticism some great advice and they told me to never give up and see the effect i was having on the children see that these children adore you and they are influenced by you and that's something i've always believed in i may not be the most perfect teacher with the most pretty classroom or the most intricate lesson plans but i know i've got an incredible relationship with the students i work with because i genuinely invest in those relationships and get to know the children and rather than seeing them as behaviors or lesson plans or objectives i see them as people and that's always been my strength i think and everybody has different strengths but that's always been mine and this mentor that i worked with who was the head of that school they aren't anymore they've moved on they were my champion and they were the one who gave me a job at that school for three for two years and always believed in me and is always there now even if i need a text or some advice and they still provide references for me now which is just amazing so i can't thank this mentor enough and it was his confidence and his determination to see me through this training that got me out of the gutter and got me my first job so i had an interview at that school and that was quite nerve-wracking knowing i'd been there for a year training and wondering well if i don't get a job at the school i've been working at it's going to be humiliating but i thought i've just got to treat it like any other interview and go in with my head held high and do my very very best and i taught year five for my um lesson observation i did think about doing year four but my teacher mentor suggested that maybe i teach a different year group to show my different abilities so i thought okay i'll teach year five and i knew what the year six teacher was leaving so i thought or maybe that would be a good idea to teach the cohort that i could possibly have so i did a visit around the school and, because it was nice because when you're training you don't really get a chance to see other classes apart from when you're observing other teachers so i went around the school and i visited the early years the reception classes and it was really lovely i just had a great time there like and it was great to go and play with them and find out what they were learning about and go and visit their mud kitchen and their outdoor space and to get to chat to some of the staff and i got a phone call later i was going out with my partner at the time we went to an italian restaurant because we were going to see um solo a star wars story at the cinema it was rubbish and i regret that but all night i was i was struggling to eat i was struggling to eat mr food fanatic was struggling to eat and my partner was saying it's all going to be fine you just need to be re relaxed eat your carbonara my carbonara arrived and just and i kid you not just as i was about to put the first delicious morsel into my mouth my phone started ringing and i went sugar this is it and i thought i'm not gonna get the job i'm never gonna be a teacher i'm gonna have to go back and work at mcdonald's and it was my mentor on the phone who's the head and he said thank you for your time he was saying we had lots of strong candidates giving me all the jargon and i just thought for the love of god just tell me i haven't got the job and he said we'd like to offer you a maternity post in reception and i just thought what the fudge oh my goodness because i had envisaged spending my teaching life working key stage two i hadn't for a moment thought that i would get a job in reception the one place where i had had so many bad experiences and working with younger children thinking i can't do this but my mentor said that the um 
reception lead said she saw something in me when I was visiting and she liked the way I interacted with the children and my natural approach and she thought that she could really work with me to make me an amazing EYFS teacher. So uh, that's early years foundation stage. So I thought, well, a job is a job and it's in the school that I really, really love. So I said, yes, I'll accept. And I was able to go back and eat my carbonara and celebrate in style. So I had to start thinking quickly about, okay, I have no idea about the EYFS curriculum. I have to start like sussing out what the hell I do. But the, the co-teacher I worked with, who was the um, head of early years at the time, was just amazing. She was so supportive. She was so excited that I would be coming to join them. And all the other TAs who work in the early years team, in fact, they still work at that school now, they were just awesome. They were so passionate about early years and about getting to work, know the children. They were amazing when I came down there. I'll talk about that post in a different podcast as well because there's so much you can go into. But I ended up working in reception for two years with a range of different teachers. And it was awesome. I never thought I would like reception, but I absolutely loved it. I loved the child-led approach. I loved getting to know the children and working with a variety of different behaviours and abilities. I loved the creative side of things. I loved the Christmas nativities. As you can imagine, I was in my element. I was doing all the choreography and the dances and teaching the songs. I was so in my element. There was so much singing and fun and liveliness in reception that you you don't almost you don't get anywhere else in primary really. And you should and I was able to bring in my own interest because I'd been in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang at the Queen's Theatre in Barnstable and a lot of the children, of course, had come to see it because it was a family show. And there were two twin boys in that year group who were just awesome. And I mean, they dressed up as me for um, for Comic Relief this year as their hero, which was just so sweet. And because I used to wear bow ties a lot, they wore bow ties as well. They were just awesome. And they told me they'd been practicing the old bamboo, the dance with the sticks from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang and they brought some sticks in and we had some bamboo sticks in school and I thought wouldn't it be great as part of their physical development and we can tick off the observations because if you're in early years you'll know it's observing and getting all the areas of the EYFS curriculum ticked off. I thought brilliant we can do some dance and it's also the um, expressive arts area as well because they can get their singing, following music, dancing, creating their own dances and I taught them the old bamboo dance and then they also got an opportunity to improvise their own and I remember being in the school hall of about 30 reception children with these bamboo canes, most of them, most of the canes that were taller than the children and a hazard and we had some quite rough children so this was a risk and they were all in the hall spaced out doing the old bamboo dance and it's just one of the, me the best memories I have. And the head at the time, my mentor came in and he said how impressed he was and how proud he was of me to inspire these children. And he was just my champion, my advocate. And if you're listening to this as well, thank you for everything you did for me. You know who you are. You are just incredible. So I worked in reception for two years and I was doing maternity for two years because there were teachers going off pregnant. I was lucky to get a maternity post for two years. But at the end of the second year, I was unsuccessful in getting a permanent place. And it broke my heart because I wanted to stay at that school. I felt like I was just getting started. I'd run a drama club there. I'd taken a group to the fringe. I'd led cycling clubs. And I just felt like I hadn't had enough time in that school. But then I also thought that things happened for a reason. So I left the school. I was sad, but I had some great memories. I had some great experiences. And then I wondered what would happen next. I had about eight interviews that summer to try and find a job. And I was unsuccessful in all of them. And that really knocked my confidence, thinking, have I just been getting off on a whim these last two years? Am I really not that good a teacher? And I got so much good feedback from these interviews. Oh, you're so passionate. You're so inspirational. We really loved your lesson. But at this time, we're going for someone with more experience or it's just not what we're looking for or you need a permanent job. There are just all these reasons. And I understood because it must be a hard job hiring teachers because there are so many incredible teachers out there fighting for very few jobs. So then I was told maybe I should try some supply. So I did. And I did supply in a in a school in North Devon. And that led on to me getting supply in another school. So I did supply in this um small school, this one form entry school. And I taught a child there. And their parent happened to teach at a school that I'd interviewed for earlier in the year. Which I really enjoyed the interview for, but it was unsuccessful. And they, this child went home and told their parent. And then I got a call from that school saying... 
oh, there's someone who's been raving about you. We'd love you to come and do some supply. And I'd written a letter there. And then once I got my foot in the door of that school doing supply, I was inundated. And it was brilliant because I ended up working reception year one, year two, year three. It was just fantastic. And then a maternity post came up at that school for January to July of this year. And I was lucky enough to get that post. And I'm there now teaching year one, the year group which I had so much trouble in and so much hardships and having my confidence knocked. And I'm now working year one. And I feel I'm starting to really hit my stride as a teacher. So it's just phenomenal how things have come full circle. And that even though I was knocked down and people told me I wasn't good enough and I should man up and get over things, that I'm now working in a school which is just amazing. I mean, the school I'm at now is just phenomenal. I'm working with an incredibly supportive team. I'm working in a year group that I thought... I would never be good at because I had such bad memories of that I absolutely adore. And that's where I am now. I'm working in this school in year one until the summer. And who knows if a job will come up there. I don't know. But this is the time where more jobs are starting to appear. So I'm getting applications out and seeing where the road will take me. But I'm three years into my... You have to apologise. I struggle with my TH sounds. That was another thing that knocked me down. I been teaching for three years now and who knows where the road will take me i mean i'm working as a primary school teacher i also work part-time as a drama school teacher as well i'm still trying to do some things with my story time channel and who knows what i'll teach next maybe i'll go all the way up to year six all i know is i want to continue to inspire young people and teachers as well i would love to be a leader one day but i'm just enjoying being in the classroom and working with an amazing team working with fantastic children and as long as i can continue to inspire and work with young people and just make a difference every day i couldn't ask for anything else i mean teaching is really really hard there are some days where you feel like you're the worst teacher in the world you feel like you've messed everything up it can be challenging with parents and some behaviors can be really difficult and all the other demands that you have as a teacher all the paperwork all the planning all the my plans and the extra responsibilities we have on top it can make it really really draining and some days i get home and i just have to go straight to bed because i'm mentally and physically drained but you know what i wouldn't change it for the world and while the theaters have been closed and there's been a lack of performing in person teaching has been the only thing really that's kept me going and story time with billy of course it's just the most incredible job in the world you've got to be made of stern stuff to be able to get through it because it's not always easy and some of the things that we have to deal with are really heartbreaking and really difficult but you always have to remember why you're there not to tick boxes and to just show the government that the children can all read and write you're there to make well-rounded individuals and to inspire these children to be themselves and to be the best they can be and to champion them no matter what their background whether they have a special educational need or a disability or whether they've been through hardships in their lives, all children deserve the chance to achieve. And achievement is different for everybody. Not all children will make the same progress. Some children will go on to be lawyers and doctors. Some children will be builders and painters. And we should encourage and champion whatever the children want to be, whatever the skills they have, because all children are different and incredible. And as long as I can keep being a part of those amazing journeys, I will never tire of teaching. So that's me in education in a an hour-long nutshell so i really hope you enjoyed it thanks for joining me on my podcast you can find all of these on my youtube channel storytime with billy i'll also be posting them on my facebook page storytime with billy as well once i work out how to post them onto a podcast app i'll let you know but tune in next time for our next podcast do let me know what you'd like to hear about in terms of education in terms of theater i'll be covering a range of subjects hopefully every two weeks and i'll try and do some live ones as well but thank you so much for joining in if you have enjoyed it please share do let people know about it as i would love this to get out to other like-minded people but until then stay safe keep smiling and remember to be kind i'm billy this has been light camera teaching thank you goodbye